One of Europe's finest and most underrated blues guitarists, Stan Webb, has steered Chicken Shack through almost 40 years of performing and recording. Since 1965, Stan has led Chicken Shack through various lineups that have included Keith Hartley, Tony Ashton, Rick Lee and Christine Perfect. Born in London in 1946, Stan was only a young boy when he moved with his family to Kidderminster in the West Midlands. I recently met up with Stan at one of his favourite watering holes in Budley as we talked about the highs and lows of his musical career. Stan, you've been an established figure on the British blues scene since the 60s, but what was it that first attracted you to playing the blues as a young musician? Oh, it go, that goes back to uh, when I was a kid, uh, I used to live next door to my grandfather and my grandmother in Brookville Road in Fulham. and. Uh, she used to have these legendary parties at Christmas and uh, also on, always on Sunday nights my grandfather would bring quite a few people back from a pub called the Californian in Fulham for the old uh, late night cold meat and pickles job you see and I only lived next door so I was allowed to stay up because I was in there and they'd have all these lovely 78s on for all sorts, Charlie Barnett, Basie, Ellington, Bunny Berrigan and all this stuff so that's all the music I ever heard was all these big band jazz stuff and things like that and I used to be fascinated by what I call grown-ups music bearing in mind I was only about seven or eight and uh, that's how I sort of took a, an interest in going down that avenue, if you like. So that's how, that's, all, that's how the seed was sown. So how old were you when you got your first decent guitar? <laughs> oh, I was glad you said first decent one. My mum and dad bought that. Uh, I, I was how old was I? I was, I was about 13. And it was, I've still got it. Uh, it was made in Czechoslovakia. And I think it cost two quid from a shop called Wilson's in Blackwell Street, Kidderminster. When Kidderminster was like a town, it's not anymore, it's sort of more of a Lego set. They sort of destroyed it all, and you've got sort of like all this stuff you have now in Kidderminster. Same with a lot of other towns, of course. And uh, I thought it was wonderful. You know, it was just brilliant playing this thing. And I, I, I'm left-handed, although I play right-handed. I'm actually left-handed. It took me ages to be able to learn to use the plectrum both ways instead of just downwards or upwards. Right. Then one day I found I was doing it without noticing. And this poor old guitar, bless it, uh, which I brush painted black on the front. I don't know why I did that, so I've still got it. And I look at it and it looks, oh God, it's not very nice. And uh, I ended up with them um, playing with uh, a man called Roger Jackson, who became Roger Laverne, you know, who played the clarinet on Telstar, the Tornadoes. And I used to go to school with his brother Tim Jackson, who played drums. And uh, we used to play at the Fountain Haberley every Sunday, without fail. I wasn't old enough to be on licensed premises, as usual. And, uh, and I used to have a geloso mic with a little switch on it stuck in the hole, doing his stuff. And uh, I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing half the time. It was just full of grown ups and stuff, and teddy boys, and what I used to call them, and stuff. And, uh, and of course, when you, you got a little bit excited, or you thought you were, the mic waggling about inside the acoustic guitar would bang on the guitar and there'd be these bumps coming out of the PA, you know, which didn't exactly uh, make me popular, but uh, I, I, was, I was dropped in at the deep end there because everybody else was, a, you know, a few years older than I was and there's me, like, you know, me little cavalry twill trousers and me jersey, me sort of short back and sides, you know, sort of like totally in awe of everything that was going on around me. So, so did, you, did you actually work at developing your own guitar style? Oh yeah. I, 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 I used to hear that like, T-Bone Walker, who was a bit of a, a superb trickster on the guitar and big showman. And 
also Les Paul with his electronics and sort of developed to now to as we speak I sort of have developed this style which is a slightly a it's classical influences there's the Ryan art and there's wonderful Eddie Lang who was before Ryan he was the first Ryan art who played a lot with Joe Venuti um, some of the Eddie Lang stuff is just wonderful um, it, a lot of it's what I call backward playing it, it's so alien the way things are, the chords and the notes are formed a lot of it seems totally backward it's not a natural there's no natural flow of progression forward on the guitar, if you like. Um, I clicked with that one day. I used to find it quite difficult. Then one day I just clicked and it started flowing. So I thought, oh, you know, I could do this. I don't know whether that's because I'm left-handed, but I play right-handed. I find it easier and can develop uh, a fair amount of uh, very quick fluency on the guitar and uh, I use my fingers a lot. Mm -hmm. I keep the plectrum in this finger and this thumb like that and bring it out like this. So I'm doing both. Um, people say, that, what happened to your plectrum? So it's in there, look, look, look. How do you do that? So they don't know. So then you just develop yourself? Yeah, it, it, it is quite individualistic, which is, uh, you know, obviously we've all taken or stolen more or less everything going in blues I mean we've, we've all done it so what were the first songs that you learned <laughs> uh, Tom Dooley it's the first song I ever learned and Happy Guitar Tommy Steele which was just a strumming thing I think that was from a f dreadful film called the Duke World Jeans with Jude Allison in it with him. and it was but it, it, you know I learned to uh, strum that, that sort of very quick Reinhardt way of playing and uh, so all these little tiny little bits and bobs sort of gradually it took years to do it gradually sort of started forming some sort of common sense but I, I only I have to say only in the last what the last 10 years or just perhaps a little bit less than that, I've actually been starting to get very happy with what I'm doing and very super confident with what I'm doing. But before that, right the way back, I never was, I never was. Now John Mayer had a very large American imported record collection to choose the songs that he played. How did you choose your material? Got the disc screen, but <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I must have bought stacks of stuff from there, loads of stuff. I mean, anything you wanted, Morris would get you. So anything you wanted, you know, Memphis Slim, Matt Murphy, Hubert Sumlin, T-Bone Walker, Freddie King, Buddy Guy, B.B. King, all, all the very early stuff. So why were so many young white boys interested in playing black man's music? What, do you mean that period? Yeah. I think because it was that period. I, I think it was just a progression once again from the 50s through to the early 60s where England started to sort of find its feet and there was, I think there was a lot of freedom for kids to choose some sort of direction which would be regarded as sort of against the normal. You are now going to work at nine o'clock and finishing at five and at 65 you're kicked out and thank you very much. I think there was, a, I think it was just a progression of when you were born, what happened through those years and I think you came out thinking, you know, life's got to be better than this. There must be something else I can do. So how did your first recording contract with Blue Horizon come about? Mike had a label called Perdar, which I think uh, there was that wonderful John Mayer, Eric Clapton record, just a two on, which uh, I've got a copy of that. It's a pretty rare thing. It's uh, Lonely Years on the one side and Bernard Jenkins on the other. It's, 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 a superb, it's when Eric was, uh, I thought, the John Mayle Blues Breakers period, I thought was the most innovating, most exciting things he ever did. Sorry, El, but it was. And, uh, you know, the Laylers and all the other bit afterwards, yeah, okay, but that 
it was just wonderful playing. There was a lot of Matt Murphy in that John Mayall album and stuff. And but I mean, the tone of the Les Paul and every, he was, you know, he, he he bought a Les Paul because he saw Fred in front of the Freddie King Sings cover album, which as when I saw that, I wanted one. You know, because we all want to get a sound like Freddie King, and uh, it was, uh, you know, quite, quite, quite a lovely period. I thought. How did you get on with the label manager Mike Vernon? Well, you have to remember because as, as we never made a record before, the label hadn't, influence-wise, they had no hits whatsoever. Because when he finished the Purr Dialogue, so it was such, such a short time. Blue Horizon in its infancy, uh, him and his brother Richard were doing it, and uh, so they're making records. They weren't making it records because they weren't weren't selling, you know, what have you. And uh, it was. Let me think. At that time, there was like Fleet, Peter Green had just formed Fleetwood Mac, and I went to I think it was Peter's first rehearsal in uh, the Black Ball in Chelsea, up near Stamford Bridge near the football ground. They were rehearsing upstairs there with Jeremy Spence and even people. And I was with a uh, uh, road manager called Hugh Price, who is still with us, still working with people. And uh, he was working with us, and he, he went started working for Peter. So he took me up there and we were watching a bit of Fleetwood Mac and stuff in their infancy. And then it just turned out that Fleetwood Mac and us signed to Blue Horizon and the other stuff they put out I mean they put records out we did I think When a Train Comes Back and Worried About My Woman I think we did another one they sort of you know caused a little rumble amongst the uh, blues aficionados as it were and then uh, you know Fleetwood Mac did Albatross we did rather go blind, and then you know, and it sort of went on from there. And I did Tears in the Wind after Christine left, and everybody said, "Oh, you know, Christine not in Chicken Shack, end of Chicken Shack." Opposite way around, you know. The, I wrote Tears in the Wind in my nan's kitchen in about three minutes. That became a hit. Chris put a record out, bless her, and it wasn't. So, uh, and Blue Horizon, as you did the rest of it, anybody who's watching this would, uh, I should imagine, know the rest of the history of that. So how would you rate the quality of the British blues players at that time on the scene? At that time? Yeah. I'm glad you didn't say now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, there, there were some lovely people about, but there were, there, there were a lot of them, you know, superb. Very, 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 very good. But when that so the dreaded word boom started creeping in. You remember, you remember the Liverpool scene, uh, Adrian Henry, jo uh, Roger McGough did that song, I've got the John Mayle Fleetwood Mac Chicken Shack Blues. Yes. And, uh, and it was those three bands that, you know, I mean, we charted with singles and albums, so did Fleetwood Mac. John Mayle had a sort of a, I think it was a bottom half, uh, top 30 album with the Eric Clapton one and so I mean even to this day you know nobody's ever done that as classed as a blues band I mean 10 years after I had a bit of a hit as well but I mean they, they were nowhere they were a blues band so that's never been repeated I don't think it ever will to be honest uh, it was just because of that era um, how talented was Christine Perfect do you think She, um, oh, superb keyboard player. Can't take that away from her. I mean, great, really excellent. Uh, what I call a light piano player who could actually do a very good left hand as well. I mean, really, you know, if you, th if you look at that um, thing we did with Shaky Jake Orton, Mean Old World, with Dave Bidwell keeping that well, I think it's an incredible different, te difficult tempo to keep without running away with it. I mean, there is a couple of classics 
on that and she's you know really really good um, a lot of so-called aficionados say that she didn't have a blues voice I don't think she did I don't think she had remotely had a blues voice I just think she sang and she sounded like a girl singing there wasn't much she had a very good range quite a good high pitch and could bend the odd note but you wouldn't call it a blues voice and of course as with her, it's the rest of its history, isn't it, really? Were you disappointed when she left the band? I was disappointed. Uh, it, it, uh, because she, I mean, she, she went to like sort of a, ended up with John, John V, and joined Fleetwood Mac. She was actually playing stuff with Fleetwood Mac when she was still with us. Mm. Um, I wasn't so much disappointed. It, it was more annoyance, was the realisation that, uh, you know, we were used as a stepping stone. And uh, and we were, you know, and uh, it is a bit of a shame that she sort of uh, neglected to uh, remember just uh, who that stepping stone was, because without that stepping stone, uh, there would not have ever been a Christine McVie. And you know, sorry if you're watching this, Chris, but it's totally true, love. At what point did playing the blues become an important part of your life? Well, <laughs> I, I hate that, the, the blues. You know. yes. uh, well, the thing is, but as people have, the reason we've, we've survived, I've survived, is because I, I could see, first of all, saw the writing on the wall a long time ago about you to, uh, if you want to broaden your horizons, if you like, you, you've got to play more. If you want to get to a bigger audience, uh, I, you know, I can't play 12 bar blues, number after number every night. Cause I want to play more melodic stuff, which I do. So I mean, there's no way to class us as a blues band. We're a show, and the show. I mean, I talk to people when I'm on stage. I'm very nonchalant, very casual. Sometimes a little bit sarcastic. I'll pick someone out in the audience and I'll talk to them all night. I say, "How's your mum? All right? How's she going? Okay? Yeah, all lovely." You know, I do all this stuff. So I introduce a bit of humour into it as well, and uh, which I think. According to the punters who come and see it's a lot of breath of fresh air because the idea, you know, that people who do it very well, but I, I just can't stand there all night staring at the floor with a puzzled expression, telling, you know, telling about how oh, the uh, swimming pool's cracked, the Rolls Royce has broke down, the butler's gone, but I've still got the blues. You know. <laughs> so you weren't like Clapton then, who said that, that he felt like he was on a mission to spread the word. Ah. Uh, you didn't certainly. Uh, no, I work. did not. No, I find you know, I, I was actually I wasn't born on the Mississippi Delta. I was born on the Fulham SW6 Thames Delta, not far from Putney Bridge. And uh, no, I did not. I, I just found that whatever I enjoyed doing, I'd do it. I didn't see any point in trying to make these sweeping statements, you know, about oh, yeah. being some sort of journeyman or something. My God, you know. Okay, well, with, with the success of, of, of the, the chart hit, I'd rather go blind. I mean, did you ever feel sort of compelled to, to maybe produce more commercial type records then? Well, so we did Tears in the Wind afterwards, and uh, that was a hit. I mean, it wasn't a chart long, but it went straight in the top ten. And at least it made a, some sort of statement that we could do it without Christine. So I didn't really care after that what happened. Um, of course, later on, we had the, the mega. Imagination Lady album, which uh, Poor Boy and you know the Loser and stuff like that, which like massive hits in Germany and everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we still do, you know, rather go blind, Poor Boy. So we do. Them. We have to do them. And I love doing them because uh, they're they're not they're not sort of jonky jonky jonk twelve bar blues numbers because I think an audience, perhaps a big audience, wants a bit more for their money than that. They want to be entertained completely, like a like this instead of that narrow avenue which I know some people are perfectly happy to do and their audiences they're perfectly happy to just see that and nothing else but when they come to see me they know they're going to get something a bit different which is why I think uh, you know that we are still here in a much bigger way sort of thing really. Now Colin Larkin in the Encyclopedia of British Pop described you as eccentric guitarist Stan Webb I mean do you think you are eccentric? If you call like uh, being sensible about getting your own way and not being trod on and not letting anybody sort of pull the 
curtain over your head. Yeah. And I suppose I'm compared to a lot of people, because I say I do do these things on stage, which, as you can see from the film, is, uh, it's some of the bits are quite sort of, uh, there's little bits of Sinatra about, there's little bits of things, the way I conduct myself on stage. People love it. You know, they, they you know, come on, you know, come into my room, join the club, come and sit around the fire, and I'll sing to you, play to you. I try and make everybody as if they are in a little room and make it very personal. What does you still enjoy about touring today? Exactly that. But I, I, like, the, I like the communication with the audience. I don't like recording. You don't? I, I, so I don't like it. I'm, I'm not at ease with it. I, I do it because it has to be done. And um, you're doing song. They, they, they always come over when they're very fresh like that. It's slightly clinical. You always end up doing them far better. If you listen to it, you think, oh, funny I'd done that. I mean, anyone will tell you that has made a record that can actually good at what they do will always say, I oh, wish I hadn't done that solo. I could have done this solo. You'd never please the artist in that respect. But I mean, I love I loved, I loved the playing, I love the attention, I love, I love the respect that you get from people. And I, especially, I do love the live on stage thing. Love it, love it. How do you account for your, your huge popularity in, in Europe? God knows, I don't know. Uh, I think because it, it's that sort of, uh, it is that rebellious way I am, I think. Uh, and that I've, I've done my time, you know, I've done the years. You become like a brick in the wall. You know, your name's on a brick and it goes in the wall of music. And once you're there, it's like being wallpaper in somebody's house. You look around and oh yeah, you know. And oh, I'll go and see that because like, it's part of what they do because you've always been about. You've done the years, in other words. So what's the recording plans for the future? I'm just starting to write stuff at the moment. It takes me ages, and then I sort of go balmy, and I can't stop. Um, I was actually lying in bed the other night, and I think about three songs went through me. And I have to get up, and I've got a little, tiny little, cheap little tape recorder, voice activated thing. I have to go downstairs and go, da 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 you know, into it. And uh, let's go back to bed. So creative inspiration can come to you at any time, then? Don't have to have yeah, a guitar. Yeah, any minute, you never know. So if you, yeah. you don't have to have a guitar in your hand, it's just... Oh, no, no, it uh, usually starts in here uh -huh. with uh, a theme. Right. Not always. It, it can be just mucking about on the guitar and you think, oh, I like that bit. What, you know, what can I nick to put... No, sorry, not nick. Uh, excuse me. Uh, what can I put in there that would be original, you know? Not that there's a lot of originality left anymore, but... Uh, uh, do you base your, your songs mainly on, on your own personal experiences? Very rarely, I don't, I don't, I, I can't imagine. Uh, obviously, there are. Everybody's done at least one. It's not the sweetest little thing about my mother, you know. Yeah, that is. But no, not really. I, I, I get my ideas from observing other people and watching other situations, or picking out a character and think I could do something with that character. And. Uh, that's what I do. But it's usually, I, I love people watching, so uh, that's, why you, that's where it usually comes from, a theme, or something that suggests a theme that might be nothing to do with what I'm looking at. It's just all in your head. You know? But uh, otherwise, uh, I think with some of the words I've written or what it was, I think my life would be a cross between Salvador Dali and a rat's nightmare. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, finally, Stan, let's, uh, let's just talk about your, your future plans for the band. Mm. What's, what's next up for Check and Check? Um, well, we're doing, uh, as we speak, we'll be doing the uh, thing in October through November this year of uh, the John Mal Blues Breakers. We're doing special guests on that. And uh, we're doing about a dozen concerts in September in England doing a few festivals in Europe and that's taken up all the time basically because we're doing 35 concerts in 35 days and about 16 before that and this is just between September and two parts through November you know the, I think I'll start when I look around to play with me teddies you know and burst out crying and things you know and sort of you know sit in my playpen and read me comics <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, with respect, I mean, as you get older, how do you keep those energy levels going to be able to... Well, I guess better. I mean, my voice has got to uh, say it myself, but caught with everybody else, some, someone has described it now as operatic. Uh, so I have an head and chest voice, and for years, I don't know where it's been, but in the last couple of years I've developed this, thing, you know, any picture you like, if you like. Somebody called me the Freddie Mercury of blues the other day, and uh, which ain't a bad, you know, it's a lovely compliment, you know. But uh, so I can, in rather go blind, you know. It's once again in the film. You see that I hang on this note at the end of the song. It goes on. We used to time it. The roadies used to time it. See how long we'd do it. And we got to like 21 seconds with this note. So I was brought up in church choirs. So I've learned to sing from the diaphragm. So you learn to breathe properly. And uh, but for years I never did that. I was singing a lot from the throat, which is a terrible thing to do. But now I'm singing back with the chair. Brilliant, just go through, love it. And I'm, I'm enjoying it now more than any time in my life. I'm having a far, far better time now than I've ever done before. And I'm, I'm apart from the Star Club Hamburg and all the swinging the 60s and all the good fun, which actually was nothing much to do with music, you know, lots, lots of other things. Uh, I'm having a far better time now than I ever did before. Much long, better. Long may it continue. Well, nice. Let's hope. Yeah. Let's hope. Stan, it's been nice talking to you. Thanks very much. Nice talking to you, sir. Thanks.